Uh, now we are going to listen to the presentation of Sam Meister. Sam Meister is a Master of Library Information Science, and uh, he has uh, worked as a digital archivist and assistant professor at uh, the University of Montana, where he could uh, uh, deal with the whole life cycle of digital information management. Afterwards, he uh, has been involved in several uh, instructions. He's instructor in digital preservation, outreach and education program, for instance, or in the arrangement and description of electronic records in several institutions across the United States. Nowadays, he's the preservation communities manager at Educopia Institute. This sounds like a new profession, but I'm sure you'll talk uh, us about this. Please. Thank you. Uh, hola, bon, bon tarde. Uh, tar sorry, I said the E and the N. That was incorrect. <laughs> um, so thank you to the seminar organizers for the, the invitation and the opportunity to be here and speak with you all today. Uh, it's particularly exciting to be here uh, at the time and the development of the Digital Continuity Project in terms of thinking about, you know, what are all the issues and elements to consider in, in forming a network. Right, forming a collaborative endeavor around digital preservation. Um, it's something that uh, the organization that I work for, Educopia, it's, it's what we do. We, we want to help people build networks to collaborate, to really work together to, to solve these issues. It's really in, I think, many people's view, the only way we're gonna be successful and sustainable over the long term. Um, so uh, today, in this talk, I'm going to be providing an overview of a, an ongoing project, and I'll stress ongoing. This is sort of a work in progress um, on creating a framework to apply, uh, creating a framework for applying OIS to distributed digital preservation. So in the previous session, uh, we had an overview of OIS, and if anybody was unfamiliar with it, I'm sure that you get everything about it already. So anything that I refer to in OIS, I'm sure it's all clear. Um, so so uh, in that regard, um, Let's just focus on the distributed digital preservation piece, um, and I'll, I'll dive into OIS where, where needed uh, along the way. So starting with the need, the, the motivation to think about uh, the, the uh, development of an additional framework. Um, OIS exists at a standard. It's out there. It's available for organizations to, to utilize in developing local implementations of digital preservation programs and systems. Uh, but as we, as we know about OIS, uh, it's, it's a high-level abstract reference model. Within OIS, there's no detailed prescriptive specifications on how you should implement a, a digital archive. Uh, it exists at that high level to provide guidance and overview for the requirements that go into developing the sorts of packages that you want to move and store and provide access to, um, but it really doesn't go down into the, the details of what that actually looks like in an implementation. And there have been uh, a number of scenarios, cases where institutions have centralized the development of, a, of an OIS uh, compliant digital archive where all of the, the ingest procedures, the storage uh, layer, um, even access are all centralized within one geographic location and one organizational environment as well, right? So that's all existing within the confines, the boundaries of a, a single organization. In other cases, uh, and this has, I think, grown over the years since the, the development and the, the release of OIS, there have been examples of multiple institutions that have uh, gathered together, uh, collaborated together to form networks of um, doing digital preservation across institutions uh, and, and you know, helping each other preserve their own digital preservation, whether that's just as sort of a storage layer environment or doing things like processing data and preparing it for, for long-term preservation, format migration, all of those sorts of um, functions. So it's not to say that OIS is not um, 
available and there's an, an opportunity to use it uh, to, to consider and develop applications for this distributed network. It's just that as a high level model, there are not the specific details of what that might look like. Um, so it doesn't necessarily map out all the relationships that are involved when you expand all of the functions and, and roles and responsibilities to multiple institutions as opposed to just one single organizational setting. So in this way, the people that, that gathered for this project originally uh, were primarily practitioners, right? People who were doing the work of digital preservation in highly distributed ways. Uh, they wanted methods to both describe, analyze, and then audit di distributed digital preservation networks. So what that looks like um, in all these different ways. And so there's a few different sort of needs that then promoted or I guess propelled uh, what eventually ended up in the framework. So these existing approaches lacked a common vocabulary for, for the work that we're doing. Um, uh, there was a need for models, sort of, again, graphical representations for building effective, uh, reliable, and, and auditable environments. Uh, an understanding of some of the differences or some of the extensions of the roles and responsibilities that are outlined in OIS, how those would map to multiple institutions and some of the slightly different activities that would be performed and then mechanisms to, to audit those environments, right? So if we think about trust and trustworthiness, um, the, the existing standards that exist to, to be able to measure and validate uh, and demonstrate that trust, um, having, having language and, and sort of mechanisms to be able to do that from the, the view of multiple institutions involved in a, a digital preservation system. So this just reiterates the title of the talk, but highlighting framework. So framework uh, is meant to uh, intend that this is not to develop a new standard to supplant, to sort of uh, take over OIS. It's really meant to sit alongside or in sort of association with uh, OIS, similar to uh, one of the graphics that was put up earlier, the Producer Archive Interface Methodology a Abstract Standard, or PAMIS, uh, which outlines the sort of set of roles and responsibilities and processes of forming a submission information package and bringing that on the part of a producer to a digital archive. So this, the intention with this project was to develop a similar sort of document that would outline all those similar elements with a sort of other sort of set of sub goals of understanding, increasing understanding and awareness among the practitioners, right? The people in the institution, in the archives, in the libraries, in the museums, in other sectors who are already using different preservation solutions. Uh, the organizations that are in the sort of early stage of making those sorts of uh, selection and implementation choices uh, the, the providers, the people who are developing these solutions, whether they're for-profit, non-profit, open source, um, any, any shape or flavor, uh, those organizations that are at a stage of having a, you know, a developed enough implementation that they want to audit those environments, and then the organizations that are actually performing those audits to be able to understand the difference between a centralized implementation of OIS versus a distributed model. So again, the audience is really looking at those organizations that are already seeking to, uh, to develop, uh, enhanced, develop or enhance or improve their existing distributed digital preservation systems, the auditing bodies that are trying to evaluate those, and also, I mean, not to leave out some of the most important people, that the, the creators, the producers of the content that we're either acquiring or we're creating ourselves as cultural heritage institutions or television producers or journalism organizations, uh, government, all of those sorts of producers, and the consumers, right, the, the researchers, the public, that are going to be accessing these materials. So to understand um, what those systems, what their operating principles are uh, behind the sort of the layer that, you know, a given 
person might see. That might be a single institution that they have only a connection with, but they can understand the whole connection between multiple institutions that are doing the work of preserving that content. So this is a list of the, the project partners uh, with, with the Educopia Institute and the Royal Library of Denmark being the main facilitators and coordinators of these institutions and organizations. And many of these, again, were institutions that were already in, in some shape or form uh, managing, developing uh, digital, distributed digital preservation systems. Uh, whether or not they would self-identify as being a network, some are clearly service providers, um, some do one piece of uh, you know, ingesting content and getting it ready for long-term preservation, but these were the players that came together and participated in the form of interviews and developing case studies and reviewing draft documents and really trying to work at all of those issues of developing common vocabulary, roles and responsibilities, all of those sorts of issues. So the timeline, 2011, a formal working group got together. Working groups are great. It's great to get together and work on things uh, to start to document the elaborations and the methods uh, needed to start doing the work of seeing how you could apply OIS to, to the DDP environment. A white paper was released that outlined sort of the goals and the elements that were going to be included in the framework. A uh, draft version of that framework uh, initially was produced in 2013 and circulated amongst multiple conferences with feedback sessions. Another iteration of the draft uh, was produced. And at this point, it's still in that, that sort of draft status, right? There isn't a finalized version of the distributed digital preservation framework, but there's enough there to get a sense of, of what it is and how it can function and how uh, emerging developing network could apply some of those uh, components to their work. So I'm going to go into it now. So these are the, the four main components of the framework as it stands today. There's terminology, roles and responsibilities, models, and auditing methodology. So I'm going to go into each of those um, and talk about them a bit more specifically. So with terminology, there's the need to sort of clarify the, the, the common usage uh, of different terms within the DDP context and make explicit those connections and mappings and relationships that are, that are endorsed within the existing OIS standard, within the Trusted Digital Repository standard, and get a sense of what those look like um, in terms of distributed uh, digital preservation networks. Um, and it's really intended to achieve a more common vocabulary um, and, and sort of support and extend the existing base of terminology. So again, all of this is not meant to sort of replace uh, what exists, but just to build on that and provide something specific. So the, the most important major term uh, to define is, you know, when we say distributed digital preservation, what does that mean as opposed to a more standard definition of, of digital preservation, right? The sort of ongoing activities of managing digital content over time into the future. You can sort of insert whatever language you want there. So for the purposes of the framework, this definition was proposed. So the use of replication, independence, and coordination to address known threats to digital content through time to ensure their accessibility. So I'm going to break down some pieces within that. So replication is attempted to, to really get at what's sort of inherent to digital preservation that you need to have copies of your data. We've heard that uh, already a number of times throughout the day. You need to have replicas of that content in distributed locations, right? Geographically distributed location to be able to prevent against and mitigate against the, the myriad types of risks that are likely to be encountered, right? Whether that's human error, malicious sort of attacks, uh, natural disasters, all of those sorts of errors, right? Just as a, in a really basic foundational way, having copies is gonna allow you to restore uh, if and when those disaster events occur. Independent, uh, independence is, is meant to start to define the, the I guess the benefit of having uh, heterogeneous uh, strategies, right? So even at the sort of storage level, right? That not all 
institutions use the same exact storage uh, implementation, maybe you know, even down to making vendor choices, hardware choices, software solutions, as well as the, the nature of the organizations that are involved in a network, that they are you know, governed differently and separately to allow for that independence in case of you know, dramatic budget cuts in higher education or in government. If you have a diversity of different institutions types, you'd be more likely to be able to sort of weather those storms that are, that are potentially and, and probably inevitably, inevitably going to occur. And clearly when we're talking about multiple institutions, you need to be able to coordinate the activities of those institutions, both in a sort of uh, technological implementation way to ensure that those content, those, those bits that are spinning on disks or living on tape, are being uh, checked and monitored on a regular basis. You need to have that carried out in a systematic way. So if there's multiple institutions involved that have different storage environments, there could be different ways of implementing those regular monitoring activities. In addition to the sort of higher level administrative coordination on developing governance models, cost models, all of those sorts of activities as well. Um, so those are the three main pieces that really go into uh, what makes distributed digital preservation unique. In addition to that important major term, there are some you know, supporting terms as well. So the breaking down into these different types of units, and these will be sort of uh, represented in the models that I'll, I'll go into in a minute. So an administrative unit, right, which can be multiple members from multiple institutions, uh, but that entity would take on you know, tasks like common watch over the network, right? So when we say common watch, that's both making sure that the systems are operating as they should, but also thinking about uh, the notion of technology watch. So as formats become obsolete, being able to ensure that preservation strategies are being implemented um, as, as needed, as, as designed. Uh, the, again, the sort of technical coordination and then planning and maintenance, both for, again, the technological environment, but also for uh, the organizational uh, framework as well. So planning to ensure that the organization is, you know, reviewing, evaluating its policies, its governance procedures, that that's an ongoing process. So a replica unit, again, is the sort of unit that forms this basic storage for a copy of data in the form of bit streams. Uh, processing unit might be something that's uh, performing a task like for format migration, so migrating from one format to another, or ingest that involves the production of technical metadata that's going to live uh, with a set of files as digital objects. Those are some of the, the supplementary supportive terms in addition to the major term. And, and what I've presented here is just a sample of terminology. Uh, there's a goal to have a much more expanded glossary of the differences um, and the sort of specific terms that would be utilized. So again, the roles and responsibilities are, are drawing from what's already laid out in OIS and really map to those functions. Um, and the, what I'm just going to talk about here quickly is this, the sorts of details that might happen, the types of actions that might be performed within a distributed digital preservation environment. So uh, you know, negotiating and reviewing content, right? And this can come down to policies that are developed around what content are we going to commit to preserving within this network. Um, negotiating the terms around, you know, what rights have to be, what sort of rights statements have to be included with, with data, with content that goes into the network. Um, coordinating and managing software and hardware configurations. And again, just at a very high level, establishing those con common standards and policies governing, you know, preservation uh, strategies for different types of formats, who can become a member, how much it costs to join, all of those sorts of things func sort of uh, get rolled into the administrative role. Rolled into the administrative role, nice. Uh, so preservation planning includes uh, monitoring those holdings uh, to determine whether or not uh, preservation strategies are being carried out, uh, what, what are needed for new and different types of contents, um, reviewing and updating those standards over time as needed, again, to be able to deal with things like obsolete uh, formats that are coming down the pipeline. Within ingest, uh, within that sort of role, there'd be the, the process of establishing what the, the data model looks like for the SIPs, right, for the packages that are going to go into the network, um, you know, de making determinations around the sort of specifications and requirements for those packages, 
um, making sure that those are, you know, reasonable, feasible, and, and ex extensible to the different types of institutions that are going to be a part of a network, uh, and then ensuring that, you know, those, those packages are then replicated over multiple geographic distributed and separately hosted nodes, right? So if it's at multiple institutions, ensuring that that replication has actually occurred, <laughs> that, you know, that it has successfully occurred, that it's met the requirements um, for ingest. And that may be, again, all of these may be one or more people. It's not necessarily its uh, position itself, but just the types of activities that would be performed. And then ensuring that you're, you're capturing and managing the types of descriptive and, and administrative data um, that's proving that, again, ingest has occurred um, and that regular monitoring is occurring and that that's available to the members to be able to check, right? To so be open, transparent, trustworthy uh, as part of that process. So storage, again, you're obtaining the packages, you're ensuring those replications are synchronized, that those, the copies are matching each other in different locations. Uh, you want to ensure the, the health of that content over time, so integrity checking, uh, making sure that um, there's uh, storage available uh, so that you can scale to different sizes uh, depending on the types of institution. If you're dealing with research data, it's a very different scale of content that's likely to be produced, acquired on an ongoing basis as opposed to other types of more um, traditional digitized library archive materials. Uh, and then again, performing those integrity edit, edit audits uh, at the appropriately designated uh, times. So data management would be, you know, the, the layer that allows um, being able to generate reports um, from the distributed locations to be able to uh, both confirm that replications that have occurred, to be able to understand, you know, sort of develop a, a report that functions as an audit log to show how the data has been managed over time. Again, all, all of these sorts of roles are meant to conform to the existing standards, right, that allow you to show documentation to demonstrate that the, the content is actually being preserved according to those uh, standards. Um, for time. And so access uh, is clearly very, you know, makes sense in this regard. We want to have standard and secure protocols for how content is accessed. And when, and when we think about access, it's not necessarily for the researchers, for the public, but in sort of a security sense, who has access to the content, uh, ensuring that there's sort of security mechanisms, that those are authenticated in some way, depending on your system. Um, and that there's a sort of set of permissions that are performed to allow the generation of a dissemination information package uh, that you would be able to provide to researchers, to the public, whoever your sort of users are. And that those are available in one or more locations, whether that's web-based, whether that's at an institution, those all come down to the, the types of policies. So models. Again, models, um, the purpose of models is really to provide this high-level graphical il illustration. So when we talk about distributed networks and we sort of bring it outside of the boundaries of a single institution, there's levels of complexity that, that start to, to sort of scale up um, when you're talking about multiple institutions that might be performing only specific functions within the network. Um, so the idea is for models is to have this overview of the, the types of elements that might be uh, important for a specific case or scenario, right? So a case of a certain type of, of data, of a certain set of institutions, um, to be able to understand and analyze what distribution looks like in that case, and then to be able to only sort of drill down to select the specific sort of pieces and units of that overall network that need particular attention at the stage of, of doing an audit or another type of analysis. So at, at this juncture, at this time, the, the sort of high level generic model that we're proposing um, is just the generic distributed digital preservation model, model. And I'll break down each of the elements. So we start with nodes, right? And nodes are basically organizations, right? So that could be a your organization might be an archive that's part of a larger organization and maybe its own independent entity. In some way, shape, or form, there's some boundaries to that. Um, so that's sort of the starting place. 
within those uh, nodes, those organizations, some may have replica units. Again, they may just be doing the, sort of performing the duty of having a copy of, of data stored in, in some storage environment within the network. Um, those are represented by the squares here. And again, those could have various manifestations or implementations, whether that's on spinning disk or tape or um, some other sort of mechanisms to be developed into the future that we don't know about that might magically solve all our problems. Uh, and then the, the processing units would be uh, where, again, sort of the, the activities for um, either preparing that content for ingest, so metadata creation, uh, f uh, file format uh, normalization, um, perhaps you know, gathering together the emulators that are needed to go with that to live with that content over time. Um, and again, this may happen at ingest. It may happen at another point in the life cycle of those materials once you know a, a migration event gets triggered due to a format format has started to uh, increase in its obsolescence. And then the sort of at the top there, there's the sort of administrative unit that again is sort of looking at the coordination tasks across the network, making sure that all the organizations are still able to participate, um, that you know storage is functioning, policy layers, all of those sorts of entities. So the lines are meant to illustrate just you know how data might flow across the network. It could be replicated at different storage nodes. It might move through a processing unit. Um, so the distribu distribution of those services to make the ingest, the checks, and access possible. Right uh, at one point, a piece of data might flow, start through flowing through a processing unit, go to storage, and then end up going back through a processing unit uh, before it's made available to a user. Um, and then again, in a simple way having geographic distribution across multiple types of boundaries um, to minimize the risk of losing that data um, and having the independence between those copies as well to minimize that risk. <coughs> Whoa, sorry. <coughs> so the other model that came out of the project was the um, the outer OIS, inner OIS model. And for this, I'm going to point uh, to a resource at the end. So El Zeru uh, from the Royal, Royal, Royal Library of Denmark has continued the work of the project in developing a, a specific implementation of the model using OIS terms. Um, so I'm just going to point uh, the audience to, to look at those resources uh, to go more in depth into that model because um, it's really beyond my level of knowledge and expertise. And finally, the, the auditing methodologies piece um, is, is one of the pieces of the framework that's, uh, I would say, still in room for an extensive amount of development. Um, but the, the components that will be a part of that that section are looking at the state of the art and auditing methods, so the existing standards, um, how those standards are being implemented, uh, what the sort of different approaches might, might be needed for uh, GDP environments, and how those, the metrics from something like the Trusted Digital Repository Standard, uh, the Drambora checklist, can be interpreted for distributed digital preservation environments when they, again, similar to OIS, are mostly constructed for you know, centralized uh, single organization environments. So while this project has been a little bit on pause for a couple years, um, the future looks bright and very uh, ripe for, for continued growth and, and evolution, uh, in, in, including the maturity of a few different distributed digital preservation networks. I'm going to talk a little bit about Meta Archive tomorrow, uh, which is an implementation of a private locks network. There are a couple other um, networks within the United States that have matured to the point of actually uh, sort of functioning in an implementation mode. Um, so there's an opportunity to start collaborating and further developing terminology, models, thinking about what auditing might look like. In addition to the, the review of OIS that, that is going to be scheduled to take place, it's already sort of taking comments, but that's scheduled to take place in 2017. There's an opportunity there to think about how the framework could again serve and sort of function as something like the PEMIS uh, standard. Whether or not it's going to evolve into a standard is still an open question, but at least as you know, a, 
a document that can provide guidance for uh, organizations that are considering forming these sorts of networks. So here are some resources, and I, I believe that these slides will be made available, so you can go to these links. There's a, a main page on educopia.org that has all of the research materials, and then there are a few um, other documents, including uh, the one at the bottom there that really dives in deeper into the inner OIS, outer, outer OIS model. And more information on all of those sort of exemplars of DDB can be found. Thank you.